every human is like a beacon. We're all broadcasting all the time. <laughs> and so just to be aware of like, what am I broadcasting? And what I would love to broadcast, you know, for myself, I would love to broadcast for every human cheerfulness. Like I love helping every human connect with that energy of cheerfulness. I would love to broadcast for every human calm. I would love to broadcast for every human. Like I am amazed. Humans are incredible. Like I come into contact with so many incredible humans. And so just that sense of appreciation and, and almost like that awareness and that respect, like we come in all shapes and sizes and forms and backgrounds and we are incredible. And we also have so much in common, just like that caring that we all have, that, that connection that we all have, that hopefulness that we all have, that helpfulness that we all have. Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Boomer women. Are we wise women? Are we mavens? Are we crones? Hell yeah. And we're also still curious, fun-loving, interesting, the list goes on. This podcast is for you. My guests are folk who have a message for our demographic. And if you want to hear a specific message, let me know and I'll find the guests. This podcast is also a conversation. We women know its value, we know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. I try and let my guests have the greater say, and usually we fit in a good laugh or two. Listen in now to today's guest. I seem to be getting quite comfortable throwing caution to the wind as here I am again with a short intro because I really don't know much about my guest's area of practice. While I do have questions around that practice, I'm also going to take advantage of having her as my guest and ask other questions I've pondered on occasion. Swami Nityananda, welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. Agnes, thank you for your warmth and your welcome. It's so good to be with you. Swami, I'd like to start at the very beginning in case our listeners are as uninitiated as I am. Needless to say, we've had some communication before today. I asked you how to address you, and you said Swami would work. It's my understanding that Swami is a title, or don't take this the wrong way, perhaps like a job description, maybe you know, like professor or, or padre. And I've also seen your email address. You have a more Anglo name like I do. Could you explain how you think of yourself and who calls you what, please? Of course. Yes, with pleasure. So I'm sitting here as we talk, I'm looking at a photograph of my meditation teacher. My meditation teacher was named Swami Shankarananda, and he founded the meditation community in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States, where I currently teach meditation. So he gave me, before he left the body, before he passed, he gave me the title of Swami and the name Nityananda. And so Swami Shankarananda was his name. He bestowed upon me consecration as a Swami and then the name Swami Nityananda. So Swami is a title, as you mentioned, and it, it's a reminder to all humans that we are invited to be sovereign of ourselves. We are invited to bring balance and harmony within ourselves. And so it's an invitation for all humans to be aware of what our own energy patterns are. So for every listener, what are my thought patterns? What are my feeling patterns? What are the energies that I move in as I move through life? And then we are invited from that self-awareness to have a sense of peace, a sense of poise, a sense of humor, a sense of wisdom and strength and courage in relation to our own energy patterns. And then the name Nityananda, he would have translated it as the bliss of one who loves the eternal, or you also could translate it as the bliss of the infinite or the joy of the infinite. And yes, I have a driver's license and my driver's license says Juniper Ellis. And so Juniper Ellis was the name given to me by my mom and dad. I grew up in Washington state and I love both of my names. And so for me, they're actually, they're just me. Um, and I, I guess I would say for, for every listener, I'm inviting you to tune in. If you think about the different roles that you play in your life, like you might be a mom or a daughter or a friend or a grandmother or a boss or an employee or a neighbor or, you know, all the different roles that you play. And none of those 
are absolutely you. They're all expressions of you. They're all true ways that you share you, but no single role and no single name can completely encompass the amazingness of you. And so that's true for every human, I think. There's almost like this light, this joy, this this graciousness, this uh, courage, this spirit within every human. And the question for each of us is just, what is the quality of that energy? How am I connected with it? And how may I share it with everyone I encounter? So with all the roles that I play, playing those roles like in a really honest and responsive, responsible, present way, but also knowing like, I'm not only a daughter, I'm not only a colleague, I'm not only a neighbor, I'm not only a friend. And so we're always much vaster than any of the human relationships and any of the human roles that we play. So you could say like, from one perspective, there's actually no human name and no human title that as that is as amazing as your listeners are. <laughs> the light within them far exceeds any human name and any human title. Okay, you've just hit on like four different things that, that pop to mind. First of all, uh, if you grew up in Washington State, I'm on Vancouver Island in Canada, so we, we would have been almost uh, neighbors. Yeah. And then I had to chuckle when you said, you know, you're somebody's mom. Not only was I the mom of three children, I was known in some areas as Maisie's mom, and Maisie was our dog. You know, So it was like, but also, and boy, I'm sure glad you, you hit on this, is that our listeners are mid-age women. And so often by this age, they've come to define themselves by what they are to other people. And and they've sort of forgotten who they are or what they could be as like what's inside. I'm sort of hoping you're, you're gonna jump in there. It's uh... I'm delighted to. And I was, I mean, I guess I was sort of pausing just to encompass, like, I think what you said is really important. It's really, really moving. So observation number one, <laughs> I would just say that the women that I know, and I actually know so many men and so many humans of all gender who, who are, this is true for them, but I would also just say the women that I know are some of the kindest and most generous, most giving humans. And so that was what I felt very strongly as you were speaking was just the incredible generosity the incredible nobility, the incredible beneficence of the listeners that you connect with. I don't know if you could feel that, but as you were naming that, you were sort of connecting with all of them. And so I could feel all of them. <laughs> so anyway, to all of you listeners, you have amazing large hearts. You are incredible. You're magnificent. And then what Agnes just named really, really wisely and compassionately is the observation that for each of us, it's easy to not remember I'll put it that way. <laughs> so we're inviting ourselves to remember actively. So just to turn within and to ask, like, who am I within myself? Like, just me, just this simple, pure energy that is me. If I let go of, I mean, I'm thinking about specific images of, like, the young mom with two kids hanging on her legs and so she's like doing dishes and she's got two kids hanging on her legs and so i know like being a mom or being a grandma being a partner being a friend it often feels that way or we might be caretaking for our elders and then it often feels that way that we're very very keenly aware of the lovely beautiful humans who are holding on to us and so just to allow ourselves to have that gift of turning within and greeting ourselves and basically saying to ourselves, like, it's amazing to see yourself. <laughs> it's amazing to be with yourself. It's amazing just to be, just that simple being. And this is sort of like, I'm gonna invite listeners to sort of play a thought and feeling experiment. If you feel your way back and you think your way back to who you were as you were a young kid, just becoming aware of yourself, like, that curiosity, that playfulness, that sense of, like for me, I loved exploring the natural world. I, I had this deep connection to Washington State, to the energy there. So I really relate to what you said about being in um, Vancouver Island, um, such beautiful area. And so for every listener, just to think about for you, what were your natural points of connection and awareness? So it might've been like 
you naturally knew yourself through music or through dance or through, you know, whatever your own skill set is, whatever your talents are, before you acquired the amazing gifts of human roles and responsibilities. And I was, I was actually thinking about this just before we um, signed on for this conversation, that often the gifts that we receive in our human lives, they also come with responsibilities. <laughs> and so to allow ourselves to feel just the sheer joy of the gift, because often I think from a human perspective, super important for us to remain responsible, like that's important. But to give ourselves that sense of like lightness in the midst of responsibility, that sense of joy in the midst of caring for others, that sense of spaciousness and freedom, like almost the ability to zoom out. Like if you've ever watched a hawk circling and they're like the whole sky is kind of like supporting them and lifting them up. And so for us in our human responsibilities, like keep tending to them, please, but also sort of like let yourself zoom out and feel like it's thrilling to be alive. Like it's thrilling to be able to look at that hawk circling. It's thrilling to be able to see the pine needles. <laughs> like every single pine needle is amazing. And to allow ourselves just the gift of that, it's very pure, it's very simple. And it's just like, it's not outside of us. Like that, that awareness, it's already with us. And it pre-exists all of our human responsibilities. It pre-exists all of our human roles. And so, for us just to turn within and and it is like a basic greeting of oneself a basic greeting of saying hi self how are you and i also would say for humans who've been very busy giving outwardly when you first turn within and you greet yourself with compassion and awareness there might be almost like sobs like you might sob and it's it's like neither happy nor glad it's just <laughs> A, a sob of relief that you are greeting yourself and that you are reconnecting with yourself and yourself is very patient yourself is always present <laughs> yourself is always with you and then the moment that you turn and you sort of greet yourself there can be like this almost like release or relief that you're making that reconnection so i'll just pause and see if you have follow-up well i think one thing that came to mind as you were speaking is all those roles that we have and the energies that we put out, the care, the love, the wonder, the curiosity. Is it possible that when we really start to look at ourselves, we say, all the stuff that I'm putting out is who I am inside. Oh, good. I just got thumbs up. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yes. Okay. And so it is, it's very much saying that. It's very much saying and I also just want to say so much gratitude and respect because moms are superheroes. <laughs> as far as I can tell, grandmas are superheroes. Aunts are superheroes, like all of us. And this is true of all genders. So if men or people of any gender are listening to this, humans are superheroes in our daily life. And I think we often, we're so aware of like that to-do list and not feeling like we get enough done. I realize that's a very human feeling that we forget to notice how incredible it is that we are so patient. We are so kind. We're so good humored. We're so like, we're able to pull forth this inventiveness and this ingenuity and this idea to help whoever it is. And then to allow ourselves to realize that, yes, as you said, it's very poignant that all of these gifts that I am sharing with others, that's expressing a pure aspect of myself. And to so actually to turn within and to say, like, I'm going to appreciate and revel in this curiosity within myself, this creativity within myself, this joy within myself, this steadfastness within myself. Yeah, this like capacious, expansive <laughs> possibility <laughs> within myself. And you're right. So everything that we express is like an indicator to us of our own nature, like our own qualities, the qualities of our own caring, the qualities of our own kindness and our own awareness. This conversation has just made concise so many thoughts, words, concepts that I, I've tried to express before, but you just made it all clear. And I need to ask you, because I can 
we're looking at each other on the computer here. Do you bring this joy to everything and everybody in your life? Because I don't think I've stopped smiling once because you just exude <laughs> joy. <laughs> so that's a very good, good question. I mean, I think probably you would have to ask everybody in my life, but I think <laughs> like what you are, what you're noticing is just, that's a very pure expression of me. Like, I don't have to think about it. I'm just simply being me, if that makes sense. So there's nothing like conscious about it. It's just a natural thing. Like I could tell, like before you and I set up our conversation to have this conversation right now, like I listened to a couple of your podcasts and I could tell like your warmth, I could tell your curiosity, I could tell your poise, I could tell your presence. And so I think every human, we have these qualities. So I just named a couple of, that came across really strongly when I first listened to you. And so I think every human, we have these qualities and very often it's people reflect back to us and help us know, like what are the qualities that are being shared? But it's totally unselfconscious, if that makes sense for every human, right? Like, I mean, my, my funny neighbor who has a great sense of humor, I think actually feels like they are a very shy human. <laughs> so they might not know how funny they are and what a great sense of humor they have, if that makes sense. So we don't always, I think we don't always have the clearest awareness of our own gifts. And that's why I think it is we, when we're, you and I are looking at each other face to face. And I think that's a really important part of being human is like in connection, in community, we're actually able to share and we're actually able to see reflected back to us like for you, like that warmth and that curiosity and that, that welcome and that poise. And so I think it really helps us to be connected with other humans. And so one of, one of the gifts that you're giving your listeners is that connection. So what I think you may have also said there, or implied, I won't say said, you implied is that loneliness can be a bigger detriment to ourselves than we realize. So I was thinking about this because I was talking with a friend who's a colleague who has young people in their household earlier today, and they were talking about their kids. I think they have a 16 year old and maybe like a 13 year old. And I think their kids have some uh, ongoing pain as a result of lockdown um, during the pandemic. And so I think it's really important to honor that and to acknowledge that. And I think especially maybe people who were young, who had less of a foundation, like less years of history and connection with other humans behind them. I think those young people may have felt it even more keenly and may still be feeling the aftermath of it even more keenly. So yes, I think it's really important to acknowledge. I think many of us when we were in lockdown came to that awareness of just how important a feeling of connectedness is. And so here's a couple of invitations for listeners. It is possible to live completely with yourself, no other humans around, and to feel completely connected and cared for. And so this is also true this is an invitation for each of us. And so if there is a listener who lives with themselves to turn within and allow yourself to connect with that energy of connection, that energy of caring, it is with you always independent of your outer circumstances. And so that's one of the things I, the meditation that I teach is in the yogic tradition. And so yogis have demonstrated this for millennia that it's possible to be completely isolated from other humans and to feel connected to the source of all connection. And so for any human, you might be in a house of 12 people. Like I also heard <laughs> students who had that experience. <laughs> they were like, there's three generations of people here. If I want access to the computer and I want a quiet space at the table, I have to get up in the middle of the night in order to have that. So that would be the opposite <laughs> extreme that humans can experience. So it's Honestly, the yogis would say, if we are living with ourselves or if we are living with 12 other humans, the invitation is always the same. Always turn within, connect with that feeling of connection and caring and quiet within yourself. And then you will feel completely connected and cared for if you are with yourself or if you are battling for <laughs> time on the computer with 12 other people. 
and you'll be able to be graceful and sort of like have a sense of humor and have a sense of just um what's the right way to put this i mean i think let's be honest it takes courage to navigate human things in time and space there's not a single human on the planet who doesn't have to call upon courage quite regularly and so just to have an awareness of okay that goes with the territory doesn't mean there's something wrong with me um, and i think that's the the human mind so just for listeners whatever you think is wrong with you if you can suspend that and sort of like temporarily set it aside and just say let me inquire directly and let me just connect with that energy of connection and caring that energy of courage and strength and just acknowledge every human no matter who they are they've got stuff to navigate in time and space and so let me just connect with that sense of peace that sense of poise that sense of possibility and then what happens is we're able to move through it more lightly and so whatever it is we're able to move through it more lightly with sort of like a feeling of our feet are steadier on the earth you know just that feeling of the winds at your back we're going to find a way forward self <laughs> like if you're talking to yourself we've got this <laughs> we're going to find a way forward so it's just sort of almost that one step at a time <laughs> yeah yeah and so to keep feet on the ground because that helps you connect with just a feeling of steadiness and the yogis have talked about this for millennia but we actually can look now there are physiological benefits to connecting with your feet on the earth it brings down anxiety levels it can decrease the heart rate it can improve the immune system it can improve the quality of your sleep and of your relationships as well so feet steady on the earth and it helps you be aware of you're connected with everyone and everything you're not separate you're never alone not for one moment no matter how it appears outwardly and then to also have that sense of you know the expansiveness of the sky above you like if you walk outside and you see the hawk soaring and the, the vastness of the sky or you go outside at night and you see all the stars lit up and you can just feel the spaciousness and the expansiveness so sort of we're in between you know the feet on the earth but we've got like this vast awareness and interconnectedness as well and then when we connect with that then we can connect with our own heart and so our own heart is our own sort of we've got this inner compass every human has it it's always here and so to be able to turn within and to say i've got this inner compass let me connect with it and let me listen to it and then the more that we connect with that compass within ourselves uh, we're always like navigating so we're always responding to okay this seems to be the case in time and space what's my inner compass saying and then we pay attention we choose we decide we move forward and then we gain increasing connection and trust for our own ability to navigate and to do it from this place of how much fun <laughs> can we have <laughs> so and that's really good because i think you know like i've read these studies i don't remember the numbers off the top of my head but the difference between how many times a day adults laugh and how many times a day kids laugh and so to give yourself the gift of laughter in a in a positive way you know just the joyful the joyful wholehearted like life is kind of amazing way to give yourself that ability to laugh okay uh, there, uh, we could go in so many directions here um i'm going to bring it back to you and your title of swami yep I take it that has to be bestowed upon you. Like somebody can't just feel in touch with themselves and start calling themselves Swami. Yeah, so the yogic tradition is that a Swami is made a Swami. A Swami is consecrated a Swami by another Swami. And so it wouldn't be something that the individual would choose. It would sort of be like a, a title or a responsibility that would be conferred upon one. And then one says yes to it. You know, I mean, okay. it's like any other role or title or responsibility. You keep saying yes every day. You say, yes, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So my my teacher, Swami Shankarananda, gave me the title of Swami. Now, on some of the podcast episodes on your website, they included a, a Sri Swami. Is that how I say it? Yeah. Sri, Sri Swami. What is that? So that's just an honorific. It's it's sort of like saying the the respected. And so in India, so my line of teachers actually comes from India. And so in India, that's just an honorific. So one could basically just say like this is the honored Swami. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay, and I, I hope this isn't a tacky question. Is is there any, any gender bias? Because I think traditionally we've always thought of swamis as men. Well, so what I would say about this is my teacher was in a male body. I am in a female body. The divine is beyond gender. And so the light in each of us is beyond gender. And you are asking an astute question. The first female Swami that I know of who was consecrated as a Swami was about a hundred years ago. So there was a teacher in India named Ananda Mai Ma and her mom was consecrated as a Swami. And she's the first woman that I know who was consecrated as a Swami. And so you're right, it's a relatively recent phenomena to encounter someone who's here in a female body who also carries the title of Swami. Okay. The reason I ask that is right at the beginning of my podcast, I interviewed a Vedic astrologer and she had come to her ranking as like one of the few women. And I didn't know if that's just the way the world turned over the centuries or whether it was slightly biased, shall we say. Well, I think that this has happened in many, many traditions. The teachings of the yoga philosophers are, as I said, they are that the divine is beyond gender and that the light in any human is beyond gender as well. And then you have human social systems and human social circumstances. And so then the question is always, to what extent does that particular time and place allow this to be recognized? in terms of human social circumstances. And so, as I indicated, about 100 years ago is the first time that I know that a woman was able to be consecrated as a Swami. Okay. On your website, I read, and I'm going to have to read this because I'm quoting, we draw on many traditions and teachers to guide us, including Vedanta, Buddhism, Zen, Taoism, and other non-duality teachings. I'd love for you to explain that, but first of all, what does non-duality mean? So it's a little bit what we've been talking about this whole time. Non-duality is just the simple realization of non-separateness. And so I can give some examples for listeners because every human, we're all connected. We all know this. I mean, like you can see a grandmother responding to a grandchild and there's just a connection there, if you want to call it empathy or you want to call it a direct kind of awareness or knowingness, there's just a connection. And it can happen if the grandparent is in the same room as the grandchild, but it can happen if the grandparent is on the other side of the country as the child. There's just a connection. And so it's that. I mean, it's that basic realization that we are all interconnected. And what the yogis realized is that it is possible in meditation to cultivate awareness of this interconnection. The reason why one would want to do this is because then this goes back to our the opening part of our conversation. I can practice discernment. If I turn within, I can practice discernment and I can say, I had a conversation with a colleague. The conversation with a colleague, the colleague was expressing stress. They were expressing grief. And then later, I can practice self-examination and I can say, oh, am I feeling a feeling of sadness? Am I feeling a feeling of distress? Am I feeling a feeling of grief? Is that my own? Or did I sort of pick up that feeling of sadness, stress, and grief from talking with my colleagues? So I can just have balance and self-awareness and clarity. And so that actually enables me to be more present for my colleague more responsive, more compassionate, more aware. It's also like I'm able to be more able to help my colleague navigate whatever they are experiencing. And I'm in a place of balanced self-awareness and that helps them be in a place of balanced self-awareness as well. Another sort of metaphor that we could use is that a lifeguard has to keep their head above water to be able to be helpful to someone who's struggling with swimming. And so just to have awareness, like we're all so connected, it really, really helps to be able to turn within and practice discernment and say, is this my grief or did I feel some grief because I talked to my dear friend or my relative or my neighbor or I watched the news and I'm actually feeling impacted by grief 
because of what humans on the other side of the planet are going through. And so for us to remain open hearted, very wise, very present, very responsive. This is the opposite of being unaware, but also to say, I'm going to be more beneficial to my friends, my family, my relatives, my colleagues, people on the other side of the planet, if I'm interacting with them, if I'm also able to have clarity within myself and peace within myself and take responsibility for my own feelings, my own thoughts, my own decisions, my own choices. And that's back to that idea where I said, each of us is invited to be sovereign of ourselves, like creating the sense of balance and peace, the sense of spaciousness, no matter what's happening externally within ourselves, every human has the ability to create that sense inwardly. You are so good at this that I'm almost feeling as as host here that it's like, I want to pause. I want to go listen to everything because you're giving us so much that it's hard to uh, to keep it all straight in my head. Now, about the traditions, they all have different names, but they must then all have similarities. Yes. So the some of the primary teachings that we look at. So if a reader wants to kind of go online and do some reading, you're a person who likes to look up the teachings. The Upanishads are a primary yogic teaching that we look at, and the Bhagavad Gita is also a primary teaching that we look at as well. And what you'll find, so in our meditation community, I think I mentioned we're geographically in Baltimore, Maryland, but we have people from all over who join our meditations because we do them in person, but also on Zoom and also on YouTube. So anyone, anywhere is welcome. And we have people from all backgrounds, all traditions, so all different nationalities, all different backgrounds. Um, some people come from different faith traditions. Some people would say, oh, I would describe myself as spiritual rather than religious. So everyone's welcome. And what the teachings do, so what the teachings of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita do is they help you connect with this sense of wisdom within yourself, this sense of strength within yourself, this sense of peace within yourself. And there are many traditions that do this. So from our perspective, and again, I'm speaking from the perspective of the yogic teachings and Advaita Vedanta, which means non-dual awareness. It's not two-ness, the culminating teachings of not two-ness. <laughs> so it's this non-separateness. Non-separate teachings can be found in many, many, many traditions. And so non-separate teachings can be found in the Psalms, in the Hebrew Bible. Non-separate teachings can be found in the Christian New Testament. Non-separate teachings can be found in the teachings of Taoism, and they can definitely be found in the teachings of the Buddha, the one who is awake. And so what we do is we pay attention and honor those core teachings. It's a, it's a way of connecting with the teachings free from doctrine like just looking at the core teachings and saying, what are the universal aspects of these teachings that any human from any background can find freeing, can find healing, can find empowering. And it's all designed to be very, very practical. So another thing that I would say is we have listeners, we have meditators in our community who are doctors and lawyers and surgeons and dentists and CEOs. We of course like have amazing artists and musicians and people who work in healing modalities as well, but it's highly practical, the teachings that we share, and they help you be your highest best self, like right where you are in daily life. Um, so that's the upshot of all of the teachings is there's an intense practicality, an intense um, way of just helping you have clarity right now, right where you are, and of helping you have a sense of being able to choose being able to take a step back and notice like these possibilities are open to me and to choose with clarity in ways that are highest and best in that moment. And then what happens is you create these pathways where as you choose what is highest and best in that moment, the next step forward, other options that are even higher and even better keep branching out before you. And so really consistently, the humans who meditate with us from all backgrounds and all walks of life, that's what they say. Like they say, this helps me be better in my family. This helps me be better with my kids or my grandkids or my beloved elder whom I'm caring for right now. They help me be better in my office or my practice or with my clients or wherever I am. 
Okay, so when you mentioned Buddha, you said the one who is awake, is that correct? Does that explain the name of your community, Awake Yoga Meditation? So our the name Awake actually comes from the Upanishads and from the Bhagavad Gita. And so it's a common refrain in the Upanishads and in the Bhagavad Gita, Awake, Arise, okay. Awake. And so it's just this reminder for every human, we're always being invited to remember, to remember this interconnectedness, to remember this peace. And I love the Buddha and the Buddha translates as the one who is awake. And so I'm super happy that awakeness also connects with the Buddha as well. And our primary inspiration would be from the Upanishads and from the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so I take it, I'm just going out on a limb here. I take it you combine yoga, the, the original practice of yoga, and meditation. Is that correct? So the original practice of yoga, believe it or not, is not about postures primarily. So the way that yoga has got brought to North America, I think there might be, I don't know what the numbers are in Canada, but in the United States, last I looked, it was like 20 or 30 million people practice yoga asanas, yoga postures. The original meaning of yoga is what we're talking about. It's how can humans live in joy and freedom in their daily life? It's union with the light within yourself. And so originally, I also like, I want to be very careful to celebrate. I practice yoga asana. I love yoga asana. In the tradition, the yoga asana prepares you for meditation. And so the yoga asana helps your body be calm and steady and able to sit in meditation, able to be peaceful. But then here's what you realize. If you practice yoga asana, you realize that the real yoga begins not when you're on the mat, it's when you're off the mat. <laughs> so the real yoga begins not when you're seated in meditation, the real yoga begins when you're in the kitchen doing dishes with the kids hanging on your pant legs and the phone rings and a neighbor knocks on the door. That's when the real yoga begins. And so all of these practices are helping us connect with just being fully present. And as we are fully present, we are connected. There is almost like a current of joy. There's a current of peace. There's a current of freedom. There's a current of possibilities, which allows us to have this awareness of the two kids hanging on the legs, the phone ringing, the door knocking, and like the dishes are overflowing, <laughs> whatever it is. That's just an example. I mean, every human has the equivalent in our daily lives. It allows you just to have that sense of like lightness, that sense of inspiration, that sense of we're going to find a way forward. What's the highest priority? And as soon as you have that sense of like, we're going to find a way forward, what's the highest priority? You'll have clarity. You'll have awareness of, okay, let me turn off the water on the sink before the sink <laughs> overflows. <laughs> let me answer the phone and then I'll take care of the neighbors knock on the door and the kids are fine. The kids are fine. They might be holding onto my legs. They're fine. Right. So for each of us just to have a sense of being with a sense of humor, being able to navigate whatever those demands are that are placed on us, like that's the real yoga. Like that's the initial originary meaning of yoga. Okay. I'm really glad you brought that full circle because as you were getting further into your explanation, I'm going like, I've been hanging on to the concepts and, and following you and you were losing me. So when you brought it back around, it was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, I think both meditation and mindfulness, they're two concepts that they're so, I'm going to use air quotes here, mainstream, that I think they've lost some of their import. Can we start with meditation? You know, in the 1970s, it was all about transcendental meditation, uh, probably thanks to the Beatles. And nowadays, there's an endless supply of meditation apps. But, but can you take us back and ground us about meditation, please? So meditation, when we practice it, always begins with connecting with our feet on the earth. And so it really does begin with grounding ourselves 
with feeling very centered and calm and focused and balanced in this moment. And so in that way, meditation and mindfulness are cousins. (laughs) They're very related. We also connect with just after we connect with our feet on the earth, we connect with wherever we are seated. We connect with the support of the seat that is holding us. We connect with how we feel at the base of the spine, connecting with the root, connecting with our foundation. And then once we connect with our root and our foundation, there is a natural openness. There is a natural expansion of awareness. Meditation simply helps you become one with who you are. It helps you become one with what is already there within you. So every human has an awareness, a light, a a boundless love, an unbreakable joy that is within ourselves. Meditation simply helps you be aware of what is already there. So you're connecting with this current that's already present. Non-separateness is the reality. And so Let's just say you have a listener who's like, oh, I would love to feel peace. Peace is already there. It is within you. And so when you meditate, you are connecting with the source of peace within you. And what happens then is you gradually steady yourself in that energy of peace. And there's, for most humans, a process where that which is not in that energy of peace gradually transforms. So for most humans, it doesn't happen instantly, and it's a practice. So that's why we call it a meditation practice. I would also say it's enormously helpful and hopeful to have a community of other humans, all different ages and races and genders and nationalities and backgrounds who are also practicing this, because you can see, you can see the kindness increasing in the people who are meditating with you. You can feel the peace increasing in the people who are meditating with you. And if you're not yet aware of the kindness increasing with you and the peace increasing within you, it just lets you know, okay, that's actually happening. And so it sort of gives you this indication of like, together we are building this kindness. Together we are building this peace. And there's an amazing gift. It's almost electrifying but it's also very, very calming. And so I want to say that the next moment. Meditating with other humans is incredible because I think it helps it be much more direct. Like if you walk into a room and the people in that room are very steady in that energy of peace, you just feel it. You feel welcomed by that energy of peace. If you walk into a room and the people there are very steady in the energy of joy, you just feel the energy of joy. And so it's like that when you have a community dedicated to cultivating this energy of peace, this energy of kindness within one another, within themselves, it almost like amplifies that whole energy of peace and kindness for everyone who connects. And so I also really want to say, like, I'm speaking on behalf of the community. The community is an amazing group of humans, just incredible. Um, So for anyone who has any curiosity, I would say you're very, very welcome. The only thing you have to do is hop on, like hop on Zoom, hop on YouTube. There's no application. There's no barrier. You just hop on and you're in. (laughs) So yeah, so come meditate with us. It's just amazing. It's so much fun. When you started to explain that, you were using the word simply or you used the word simply a couple of times. And I'm thinking, oh, that's an oxymoron. But I can see that when it becomes a practice, then it becomes more simply defined, shall we say. I can see that now. Now, the the other question is, in your meditation groups online or however, do, do you lead a meditation or is it something that's more internal and, so, and silent? So if anyone hops on our Sunday meditation, it's I'm in Baltimore, so it's Eastern time. Um, Sunday meditation at 11 Eastern time. Very often, I will be the one usually who is leading that meditation. And what we do is I will offer a few words at the beginning. And those words are entry points. So they apply for new meditators, but also for longtime meditators. If you would like to use those entry points to help you meditate, you're welcome to. If you have your own meditation practice, you're also welcome to just go straight to the stillness, straight into the silence. And so we have about a 20 minute silent meditation at the outset. 
And then what I would do is for about 30 minutes, I would give a talk. And the talk that I would give is very related to what we're talking about right now. So it's very practical. It includes teachings from the yogic tradition, but it's also very practical. It's like, how do humans do this in daily life? And what does it look like? And what does it feel like? And what if you have challenges? And what if you have questions? And then on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, we do a 30-minute meditation, which is a mini version of that. So someone would say a few words at the outset, and then there would be about 20 minutes of silent meditation as well. Fridays, we do sort of a version. Again, it starts at 7.30 on Eastern, but a few words at the beginning, about 20 minutes of silence, and then a meditation talk. Fridays as well. And then we also have teachings online. So for anyone who wants to check them out, we have teachings on YouTube. If anyone's on Facebook, we have teachings on Facebook as well. And we also have teachings on Instagram and TikTok. I I had a specific reason for asking whether you led or not, because up until this part of our, our conversation, you've been full of energy and buoyance and, you know, like it was, and then as soon as you t- start talking meditation, your voice dropped, everything calmed out. And then even when you were talking about your group, you talked about the lead in and then the silent time. And then in the talk, your voice buoyed up again. So it's really interesting. You, you really bring the, the specific energy, which is, uh, it's, it's, it's really neat to listen to and to watch you as you do that. Thank you for saying that, because again, it's completely spontaneous. It's completely natural. And one of the observations that I do have is that when we are in contact with peace and quiet, I mean, it almost just makes me cry. What arises naturally is joy. Like when we are in contact with peace and quiet, I think that there are many humans who have a craving for peace and quiet, might not know that they have a craving for peace and quiet, but I think we have created a culture where our nervous systems are sort of on all the time and we're receiving invitations to be worried or afraid all the time. And so I think then when we have this ability to come into contact with that peace and quiet, it is precious. <laughs> and it, I, I actually would say it's very simple. Like the peace and quiet is here within each of us. And then what happens is it's such a gift because as soon as we have contact with that peace and quiet, it's like, if i'm sure you have i have listeners have walked into a forest and just the silence is so sacred and so potent and it's almost like all the human stress kind of melts away and you just breathe deeply and you're connected with that energy of joy as soon as you're in contact with that energy of peace and quiet the energy of joy also arises. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I know, I mean, I live in a city now. I grew up in small town Vancouver Island, so lots of forest. And living in the city now, I can really feel my stress levels rising when I don't get my peace and quiet. I do crave it. And, and I need to just walk away from things sometimes and just come home to my quiet home and uh, yeah yeah so it's interesting that uh, that you emphasize that mindfulness it's it's so important and I feel it's so important but again in so many areas it's been overworked over um, I don't know what the word is but people roll their eyes now when you say mindfulness but can you talk about your idea of mindfulness please it's just you being you perfectly you it's so simple i mean it is you being perfectly you you being open-hearted right where you are for any listener you being kind do we need to add in this moment i mean if you are being you the moment is there Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure you know that, but, and I'm sure listeners know that as well, but mindfulness is simply fall in love with this moment. This moment is the moment. And so if you fall in love with this moment, you will be living a magnificent life and it's independent of anything happening outward. So it's just you being the energy of adoring and awe and wonder in this moment. Yeah. 
I talk about the term or the concept of mindfulness a lot. And in order to bring it home, I'll sometimes say, do you really notice, and this one hits home for me, that first taste of coffee in the morning? Or is it just a habit, a routine? Um, yeah. You know, when you first get into the shower and you feel the water getting through your hair to your scalp, can you really feel that, like right in this moment right now? And uh, yeah, so it's just, um, they, you know, the past is past and the, the future is not here yet. So all we really have is this moment. And it's amazing. I mean, being in this moment is absolutely amazing. <laughs> okay, I feel like we need to take a deep breath here. Our listeners are mostly mid-aged women. They've had their share, perhaps more than their share, of bruises from life. One of your talking points is how can we transform pain, obstructions, limitation, fear, and suffering to live in joy and freedom? So for listeners, I think for your listeners of any age, for your listeners of any gender, it really helps to acknowledge if you have a feeling of sadness to just simply acknowledge it. And then to also know that as you name that feeling of sadness, you are not limited to that feeling of sadness. You are not limited by that feeling of sadness. It does not define you. It does not confine you. And anything that arises will also depart as well. So to give yourself this awareness that waves of feeling arise and they're basically neutral from the perspective of yogic teachings, feelings are basically neutral, it's energy. And so any feeling of sadness, if we stay in awareness, we can transform that energy into peace, into acceptance, into understanding, into healing, into compassion, into inspiration to help others, perhaps. And so it's also giving yourself the gift of realizing that any experience that you have gone through, acknowledge how brave you are, acknowledge how amazing you are. One of the things that my teacher said was keep the wisdom and allow the pain to melt away. So keep the wisdom and then now say, how would I love to move forward from here? Keep the wisdom and say, what are the gifts that I have received? that I would love to use to create this next new chapter of my life. As long as we're here, there is a new chapter unfolding. We're part of that new chapter. And so for us to give ourselves the gift of honoring and acknowledging our experiences, but remembering that's not who I am right now. That's not where I am right now. Right now, I am here in the quiet of this moment. I am here in the beauty of this moment. I'm here in the peace of this moment. I'm here in the possibility of this moment. And how would I love to use my freedom to choose? What would I love to create? And so to focus more on what we would love to help make visible and to be willing to allow anything other to simply melt away so that we're not carrying it into this moment. We have the ability to carry <laughs> the past into this moment. But we can give ourselves a gift of saying, I'm laying it down, I'm keeping the wisdom, I'm here in this moment, what would I love to move forward to now? And there can just be like this incredible sense of venturesomeness and this incredible sense of full, like you were talking about being fully aware, being fully present, being fully available. And then we are tasting, like we're tasting the freshness of the water drop in our glass as we drink water. We're tasting the freshness of the air as we're breathing the air. We're noticing the brilliance of the light as the light is shining. We're noticing that if it's raining, rain is an incredible, miraculous gift. If we're able to walk our feet on this good green earth, we're able to notice like that is incredible and it connects us with all of life. And so it gives us more of that sense of delight just like right where we are, simple delight. So like nothing elaborate has to happen. Nothing has to change. We're just able to delight in our own life energy, in our own being of ourselves right in that present moment. And so I would just invite listeners to connect with for you, 
every listener has these points of connection, these avenues of awareness, these simple things that are with you right now, don't take anything elaborate, and just gives you this sense of joy, the sense of possibility, the sense of purpose, the sense of fun, the sense of aliveness, and to give yourself those gifts, like right now, without waiting, in daily life, and then just notice, like, everything else becomes much easier, and it becomes much more fun, and it becomes you're giving yourself almost like the gift of freedom, the gift of spaciousness, even as you attend to all the incredible gifts and responsibilities that you attend to. Part of bringing the joy, I feel, is, as you've given me for however long we've been talking now, is, is that smile and the eyes lighting up and things like that. And, and I know if I'm out and about, it's so easy just to be like no expression but as soon as you really become aware and try to walk around with a smile making eye contact is is you do you know get in contact with other people you do have that that moment and one of the gifts of COVID was the mask and I really encouraged people to put a mask on stand in front of the mirror and make sure your eyes said joy, thank you, appreciation, all those things, because the words might have come out, but there was no other expression. So to really make sure that your face is is giving us that. It's a wonderful gift. I really love what you said. I mean, I think in some ways, as you were talking, I was, it was just coming to me. I think in some ways, every human is like a beacon. We're all broadcasting all the time. (laughs) And so just to be aware of like, what am I broadcasting? And what I would love to broadcast, you know, for myself, I would love to broadcast for every human cheerfulness. Like I love helping every human connect with that energy of cheerfulness. I would love to broadcast for every human calm. I would love to broadcast for every human. Like I am amazed. Humans are incredible. (laughs) Like I come into contact with so many incredible humans. And so just that sense of appreciation and and almost like that awareness and that respect, like we come in all shapes and sizes and forms and backgrounds and we are incredible. And we also have so much in common, just like that caring that we all have, that, that connection that we all have, that hopefulness that we all have, that helpfulness that we all have. And so then I, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. When, when we're in that energy, then that will be able to be reflected back to us. So it might not even be like you might smile at one person and it might not be that person who smiles back to you, but someone will. <laughs> like That smile will definitely radiate back to you. Yeah, it really hit home for me a bunch of years ago when I came out of a store and there was a homeless person sitting there and and I didn't have anything to, to give them, but I smiled and said, hello. And he grabbed my hand and he said, thank you for that smile. Like it, it's the biggest gift I've had today. And I went, holy moly, it really did hit home on, we, we need to put that energy out there because we don't know who's in this environment that that might need it thank you for that story and thank you for being that smile that's very beautiful it's very precious do you have any other thoughts for our mid-age listeners as they traverse this next stage of life you are amazing and trust the light within you trust that sense of venturesomeness and courage within you it is incredible you have so much wisdom so much strength you have so much courage you have so many gifts you are amazing. And this is one of those times when I wish we were recording video because as you said that, it's like she's talking to me and then I'm going, she's talking to every one person that's listening, <laughs> every single individual out there. So thank you for that. You, yeah, you exude that. Before we close, can I ask you a personal question? You may. Tattooing the world, Pacific yeah. designs in print and skin. I am a professor of English, and I published a book with Columbia University Press. Agnes just mentioned the title, Tattooing the World, Pacific Designs in Print and Skin. And so one of the areas of literature that I absolutely love comes from Oceania. So places like Maori writers from New Zealand, writers from Samoa, writers from other areas of the Pacific. And one of the things that I noticed was that tattooing, the word, came from Tahiti. 
And so it was actually imported into English by Captain James Cook in 1769 when he was traveling around the globe. And his sailors started copying tattoo patterns on their skin and then they traveled. And then what happened was Captain Cook wrote about tattoo and his journal was published and became the equivalent of a bestseller. And so that was the origin of the word tattoo. So I was noticing that at the same time, I was noticing the increasing visibility of tattoos in the young people whom I teach, for example. And so I just wanted to tell the story of the origin of tattoos and like where they came from, what they mean in their original Pacific context, and then how they, as they travel, they obviously acquire different meanings. But very often the origin in the Pacific, they, tattoos help identify who you are, where you come from, uh, the ways in which you belong to the earth and the sky and the seas and the cosmos. And they also help make visible that you are ready to be of service. And so that's a beautiful reminder for all of us that we are all here, we're all connected, and we're all here to be helpful. <laughs> we're all here to be as much of service as we possibly can. Okay, I'm not going to go into that line of thought, because you, but you just reminded me of other things, so that's, that's amazing. Where do we find you on the World Wide Web? So awakeyogameditation.org is our website, and you'll find information there about, we have Sunday meditations, Tuesday meditations, Friday meditations. We also have a Wednesday study group. There's um, teachings that we offer on YouTube, on Instagram, TikTok, on Facebook. Everyone is welcome, all backgrounds. And so this is people who know all about yoga philosophy and meditation, but also if you've never heard of it before, everyone is welcome. And we have a whole range, like we have longtime meditators, but we also have new people. We have people who are nine years old who meditate with us. We have people who are in their 90s who meditate with us. So it really is very welcome, um, just an incredible community of humans. So I encourage everyone who's interested, please check us out. Okay, I will get some of or all of your uh, social links from you after we, we conclude here. You've written another book on Awake as well. Awake, the Yoga of Pure Awareness is available at awakeyogameditation.org, our website. And Awake is what we've been talking about this whole conversation. So Awake shares teachings from the Buddha, the one who is awake. And what the teachings say is that the same awakeness that is within the Buddha is within all humans. And so the Buddha is saying, that's the invitation for all of us, turn within and connect with sweetness within yourself. Turn within and connect with kindness within yourself. Turn within, connect with wisdom within yourself. It's actually already there. And the Buddha is saying, everything that we see in the Buddha, it's within us. So our next step is to turn within and cultivate those qualities within ourselves and be willing to let go of anything other than those qualities. And so an example that he gave is that if you are noticing bees, keep going because you'll find honey. <laughs> so don't be distracted by the bees, keep going and you'll find the sweetness. So whatever it is that, um, like another image that he gave was he said, like you might see a statue that's been buried in a field and the statue might be covered in dirt. So if the first thing you notice is this seems to be covered in dirt, keep, keep going, clean the statue and then you'll see the beauty that is there. So whatever it is that you notice in yourself, don't be detoured, keep going. And that same energy of sweetness, that same energy of beauty, it is within you. I think what I heard there was, my first thought was like, don't take this the wrong way. Easy for you to say, but as you say it, you make it, you awaken <laughs> the possibility of finding that place. So I, I can do this. And so I would actually say this is a really important, I'm, I'm starting to share a teaching from the yogic tradition. The yogis actually say, I just want to give such a tribute to my teacher, Swami Shankarananda, because he was a radiant beacon of light. And I walked into a Friday meditation the first time I saw him, and then I became aware this is a beacon of radiant light and my life changed. And yogis say that it's vital to come into contact with someone who is here. They're a human, but they're also serving as a beacon of radiant light. And they just basically let you know exactly what you said. Oh, this is possible for humans. 
So of course we all need this, like, of course. And that's why, so in the yogic tradition, my teacher appointed me as his successor. That's part of the tradition that you basically, like what the teacher does is essentially say, I've been carrying this light. I'm passing this light to my successor. My successor is now carrying this light. And it's exactly for that reason. So the light can be anchored in time and space. And so other humans look at it. It actually is very simple. It's not to say that it's easy, but it actually is very simple. It's just to say, oh, there's a person. They walked this way. Like they walked this way before me and they did this. And that lets me know this is possible. This can be done. And so it gives you like strength, it gives you courage. The yogis also use a word that they call grace. And so it's just the energy of a human who is strongly established in that awareness and that awareness transmits itself. It is like a broadcast. It is like saying, home is possible. (laughs) Like, welcome, (laughs) like, welcome, it's possible. Home is here, like home is wherever every listener is. And so. It is just an incredible gift that that my teacher, so he founded our meditation community, Awake Yoga Meditation, and he shared these teachings for 38 years. And then before he left the body, he trained me and appointed me as his successor. And I've served as his successor since 2014. So it's a great joy, but also just every word I speak, if I'm saying my teacher's name or not, it is a tribute to him. (laughs) So yeah, and just such a great joy, like that energy of, connection and kindness. Um, You could call it like spiritual sunshine if you want. It's so present. It's so palpable. And so people say that like when they walk into our meditations or when they hop online and join us, it's the whole community is part of this energy field and it's expanding. So everyone's welcome. Like you're all welcome. Everyone's welcome to be part of this energy of spiritual sunshine. And it's just the energy of self-remembrance. It's the energy of remembering this is actually our true state. This is actually our true nature, like the energy of connection. That's the reality. That's the truth. And so it's just incredible to have other humans who are like, this is the truth. We are in that energy and this is the reality. This is the realization. Long pregnant pauses don't work in audio recordings, but I would just love to sit for that moment and have everybody just think about about your words. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, please talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening, or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us grow. I always suggest you share episodes. And having spent this time with Swami Nityananda, I think you'd be doing your friends a favor by sharing this episode. We can all do with more peace understanding and mindfulness in our lives. Swami, thank you for being my guest today. I so appreciated this. Agnes, it's a complete joy to talk with you. Many, many thanks to you and to your listeners. Thank you. Have a great rest of the week.